Welcome back to Hover Unbox. Today we are taking a look at DDR5 memory scaling performance of AMD's latest Zen 4 architecture with the Ryzen 7 7700X, and I'll be comparing it with Intel's Core i9-13900K. Now the reason for this is I want to see how much memory performance affects Zen 4, as I have done very limited testing to date, and we know that DRAM latency has been an Achilles heel of previous generation Zen architectures. But please note, this is not a value analysis. I am well aware that the Core i9 costs around 70% more. That is not the point of this content. Also, as I'm sure many of you have noted, there's a massive discrepancy between review data for Zen 4 processors, especially when it comes to gaming performance. Now, most of you have chalked this up to a difference in the test system configurations and the games used, as this is the most level-headed and logical conclusion one could make. However, there are some, mostly found skulking around places like Reddit, that are adamant the most obvious conclusion is some reviews are paid for or are just outright biased. Makes sense, right? Well, I decided that the logical level-headed conclusion was probably the right one. So to find out, I've done a little bit of testing. As noted in my day one Ryzen 7000 series reviews, we used the supplied DDR5 6000 CL30 memory as AMD claimed this was sweet swap memory for Zen 4. And prior to ever testing Zen 4, we just had to take them at their word and it does seem as though they were correct. And all CPUs do support this memory with ease, and given that it does ensure the absolute best performance for enthusiasts, at least out of the box, it makes sense for our audience. Mind you though, we would do exactly the same thing for Intel if they provided memory with their review kits, but as it stands, they don't. But in any case, we still use quality memory when testing Intel processors, opting for CL32 DDR5 6400, which actually costs a little bit more than the memory used to test Zen 4. Now, depending on the games used for testing, I've found the Core i9-13900K to be on average 4% faster than the Ryzen 7 at 7700X, with the Core i7-13700K around 1-2% slower, so basically overall they deliver comparable gaming performance, which seems reasonable. But for a sanity check, Jared's Tech found that the 13700K is 2.5% slower than the 7700X in a 24 game benchmark, and he uses the same DDR5 6000 CL30 memory, but for both AMD and Intel processors. Of course, that's the average performance difference across a decent number of games, but I have found instances where the 13900K is between 15 to 20% faster, such as F122 and Spider Man Remastered, for example. The question is, does slower memory cripple Zen 4 more than it does Raptor Lake? And if so, how would this influence our CPU testing and recommendations moving forward? Well, let's go find out. Now, please note all of this testing was conducted using the GeForce RTX 4090 at 1080p. And if you'd like to learn more about why we test the way we do, I'll link to another video in the video description that explains this test method. And the Ryzen 7 7700X was paired with the Gigabyte X670 Aorus Master and the Core i9-13900K with the MSI MPG Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi. Okay, let's get into the graphs. First up, we have Spider-Man Remastered. And let me quickly explain what's going on here with all those colored bars. The yellow bars highlight the DDR5 6000 CL30 kit that AMD provided for testing Zen 4 while the dark orange bar is a cheap Corsair DDR5 5200CL40 kit, which I'm using as a sort of baseline here. I've also included a few other kits such as DDR5 7200 for the 13900K, just to show a better out of the box experience. And really this is probably the best out of the box experience you can probably achieve with all Raptor Lake CPUs. And then we have a range of alternative kits for the 7700X, such as the Corsair Dominator DDR5 6000, and then a cheap Kingston DDR5 6000 CL40 kit, and then a DDR5 5200 CL36 kit. Now, apart from the fact that the 13900K is quite a bit faster than the 7700X in Spider-Man Remastered, which we already knew from previous testing, there are some interesting and perhaps concerning results here for AMD. Using the DDR5 6000 CL30 memory, highlighted as yellow in our graph, the 13900K is 11% faster than the 7700X, which is very similar to the 16% margin found in my 13900K review. Though there the Core i9 was paired with DDR5 6400, and both platforms were using older BIOS revisions. Anyway, pretty similar data to our day one review. The problem for AMD becomes quite clear when pairing both CPUs with the much more affordable DDR5 5200 CL40 memory. Here the 13900K is a whopping 28% faster than the 7700X, or an eye-watering 45% faster when comparing 1% lows. 
That's a devastating margin for AMD, and it explains why Zen 4 gets so trashed in reviews using DDR5-5200 for the AMD processors. Even if we upgrade the Ryzen 7 with CL36 DDR5-5200 memory, the 1300K using CL40 is still 26% faster. So in short, it would seem as though clocking the Infinity Fabric so low cripples Zen 4, which is a worry given that 5200 is the base spec. Okay, so margins in the Callisto protocol using DDR5-6000 CL30 memory are very similar. Here the 1300K is 12% faster, jumping up from 241 FPS with the 7700X to 271 FPS. And in this example, we find when pairing both CPUs with DDR5-5200 CL40 memory, that the margin extends to 22% in favor of the Intel CPU. It also appears as though memory timings are one of the biggest issues here for Zen 4, as performance also tanked with the 6000 CL40 kit. Next up we have a Plague Tale Requiem, and here the 1300K was 8% faster than the 7700X when pairing both with DDR5-6000 CL30 memory, so not a huge margin there. But again, that margin does blow out with 5200 memory, as we see when comparing the dark orange bars that the 1300K is 25% faster, and that is quite a brutal margin. Horizon Zero Dawn is an unusual title in the sense that it has always heavily favoured Zen, and perhaps we're getting a hint as to why with this testing. It looks to be almost the Cinebench of games, as memory performance has very little influence on the results. With Spider-Man we saw an almost 22% performance uplift for the 7700X when moving from DDR5-5200 to 6000, whereas here we're seeing a mere 7% increase. Meanwhile the 1300K saw a 1FPS change, so half a percent movement from 5200 to 6000 memory. So perhaps with DRAM latency almost being a non-issue here, it's why the 7700X is able to beat the 1300K by a massive 22% margin when using DDR5-6000 CL30 memory for both processors. The Rift Breaker results have changed quite a bit since our initial testing, and I'm not entirely sure as to why, as quite a few things have changed, such as the BIOS revision, display driver, and even the Windows version. Whatever the case though, the 1300K has seen a 7% performance improvement, while the 7700X has only improved by 1.5%. Neither is a massive margin admittedly, but whereas performance was similar previously, the 1300K is now 8% faster. But that 8% margin does blow up quite substantially to 25% when pairing both CPUs with DDR5-5200 memory, so another terrible result for AMD when using the more affordable DDR5. The shadow of the Tomb Raider results on the other hand are almost identical to the day one review, where the 1300K was 13% faster. Here, it's 14% faster. The real issue though, can be again seen when using DDR5-5200 memory, as here the 1300K is now 27% faster, as the Core i9 dropped just 8 FPS, whereas the 7700X dropped a massive 33 FPS. Finally, here's the Watch Dogs Legion results, and previously I found that the 13900K was 10% faster than the 7700X in this title, but in this example, the Core i9 is just 4% faster, when both are using the same DDR5-6000 CL30 memory. So not a big difference there, and I'd say with this premium memory, this is actually a great result for the much cheaper 7700X. Unfortunately though, when using the more affordable DDR5-5200 stuff, the 13900K was 21% faster, dropping just 3 FPS, whereas the 7700X tanked by 27 FPS. Okay, so here's the average performance seen across the seven games we just looked at. On average, we're looking at a mere 2.5% performance uplift for the 1300K when going from 5200 to 6000 spec memory, so a negligible difference there. The 7700X, on the other hand, saw a far more substantial 17% increase, meaning Zen 4 is significantly more memory sensitive. And this is a massive problem for AMD, because when using the DDR5-6000 memory, the 1300K was just 5% faster, which is a negligible margin really, and certainly doesn't warrant the extra investment in the Core i9 processor. However, when arming both CPUs with DDR5-5200, the margin blows out to 19% in favour of the Core i9, and that does start to become significant, as it's effectively an entirely different performance tier. So by using the G-Skill Triton Z5 Neo RGB DDR5-6000 CL30 memory, we are showing a best case result for Zen 4, at least when it comes to out of the box performance. And granted the DDR5 6400CL32 memory that we use for testing Raptor Lake is still providing a very strong out of the box experience, 
a 7200 kit will offer around 3 to 5% more performance. The biggest problem is the fact that if you were to pair a 13th Gen Core series processor like the 1300K with slightly more affordable memory, you'll still see similar performance to what's shown in our reviews. Basically, anything between 5200 and 7200 will typically be within 10%. Zen 4, on the other hand, will typically be around 15% slower than our review data, assuming you go with something like cheap DDR5 5200 cell 40 memory. So that can be a real problem, and it is well worth being aware of. And this also explains why reviewers who tested at the official memory specification receive data that varies wildly from our own. Pairing Zen 4 with DDR5 5200 while giving Raptor Lake DDR5 5600 is a brutal matchup that is going to end horribly for AMD, but I'm certainly not saying it's the wrong way to test, as that is the advertised memory spec. However, for our audience and our own recommendations, I think it makes no sense to test that way, as we've never recommended base spec memory for either AMD or Intel processors, and in fact we've actually recommended you avoid it. And the reason being that sweet spot memory generally doesn't cost that much more, and typically offers a lot more performance. For example, the most affordable DDR5 5200 32GB kit costs $115 US. It's a Team T-Force Vulcan CL40 kit. For just $20 more though, you can buy G-Skills Flare X5 DDR5 6000 CL36 kit, and for just $10 more, you can get G-Skills Ripjaws S5 DDR5 6000 CL32 kit. Now, the premium stuff that we use for testing, that does cost $180. But you can purchase a similar spec kit such as the Team T-Force Delta RGB DDR5 6000 CL30 for $155 or the $145 G-School Ripjaws S5 DDR5 5600 CL28 kit which can be tuned up to actually be made faster than what we test with. So the reality is you're saving a measly $30 by going with the entry level 5200 stuff which is why you wouldn't purchase it. It really makes no sense when talking about CPUs that cost well over $300 that are likely to be paired with a $200 plus motherboard. At the end of the day memory really matters for AMD's new Ryzen 7000 series but not so much for Intel's 13th gen processors. Faster memory certainly helps improve CPU bound gaming but more crucially slower memory doesn't cripple performance and that's a serious strength of Intel's architecture. Moving forward, I think we'll continue to use the DDR5 6000 CL30 memory to represent AMD processors, but I will note that slower memory can have a noticeable impact on performance. That said, as always, I would love to hear your feedback. Uh, do you think the 6000 CL30 stuff is appropriate for testing, or should we perhaps switch to cheaper, more affordable, even if it is only slightly more affordable, CL32 or maybe even CL36 memory. Let me know in the comments section below. I'll be sure to read them and we'll take note of your feedback. And that is going to do it for this one. Thank you for watching. Uh, give it a like if you found it useful. Also, if you'd like to support the channel directly and get some cool perks in return, we have Floatplane or Patreon. You can sign up to either one of those. Either will give you access to our exclusive Discord server for members only, a monthly live stream. Tim and I get together and do that, answer your questions live and put on sort of a live show, I suppose. Behind the scenes content, Q&As, a lot of cool stuff there, so yeah, check it out if you're interested. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.